Neil, for your queen. She's Hela, sister of Thor in the Marvel comic universe and Galadriel, the mystical elf in Lord of the Rings. She's portrayed Britain's Queen Elizabeth I, composer-conductor Lydia Tarr, and the Irish investigative reporter Veronica Guerin. She was Lilith Ritter, the femme fatale in Guillermo del Toro's Nightmare Alley, and the loathsome yet lovable Jasmine in Woody Allen's Blue Jasmine. With a career in film and on stage spanning more than three decades, Kate Blanchett is easily one of the greatest actors of her generation. But the Double Academy Award winner also plays important non-fictional roles. In 2016, she was appointed Goodwill Ambassador to the UN Refugee Agency. Since then, her advocacy work has taken her to Cox's Bazaar in Bangladesh, where she's met Rohingya Muslims who fled persecution in Myanmar, and to Lebanon, where she met Syrians forced from their homes by 12 years of war. Her latest trip was to Jordan, which is hosting more than 743,000 refugees. We caught up with Kate in London to discuss the UN's operations and how the refugees she's met along the way changed her perspective. Kate Blanchett talks to Al Jazeera. Kate Blanchett, thank you very much for talking to Al Jazeera. Thank you for the time. I want to ask you about your missions to uh, Jordan, Lebanon and Bangladesh as UNHCR Goodwill Ambassador. Mm. But first, uh, let me ask you why you chose to get involved with this organization. Why does it matter to you? Yes, I've been working with UNHCR, the UN Refugee Agency, for seven years now. And look, as, as an actor, I see my job as an empathetic one. You step into, on a prosaic level, you step into other people's shoes and try to understand their point of view. And so it's a natural thing for me to be curious about the stories of other people. And I suppose that's what I see my role as Goodwill Ambassador is, is trying to put the human face on the numbers, you know, when I started working with um, UNHCR seven years ago, I think the number of people displaced around the world was about 60, 61 million, which is enormous. But now it's upward of 103, and I think it's really difficult for people to digest that. So I felt that I had maybe um, an inclination or a skill set that could communicate those stories. But then on another level, I'm Australian, and um, I come from a culture which, you know, colonial invasion not, notwithstanding has been positively built on the welcoming embrace of asylum seekers and refugees. And uh, we are in um, the Asia Pacific region, but we've been colonised by Britain. We're a real melting pot. And I watched over the late 90s to the present day that welcoming embrace calcify and I saw the impact it had on the national conversation and on people who called themselves citizens of Australia. And, I, and watching that rhetoric um, of um, exclusion and to, you know, um, and really contravening humanitarian um, laws, I found um, that rhetoric being exported overseas, I felt that maybe I had a particular perspective which might be of interest. And do you remember the first time you visited a refugee camp and what it was like? Well, of course, not all refugees are in camps. So having recently gone to uh, Jordan, I think that was the first time um, seven years ago I went to, to, to Jordan with UNHCR. I went to Zatri and to, to Azraq. And, um, and Jordan has been, as you know, has been deeply welcoming to, um, to refugee, Syrian refugees in particular. And to look around at that camp of 80,000 people, which is not insubstantial, but of course there's 670,000 um, refugees in, in Jordan. And um, knowing that half of those um, in that camp population were under the age of 18, as a parent, I found very overwhelming. But what was remarkable was the resilience and the inventiveness um, and the sort of the instant community that had, had sprung up there. And I think that actually flouts this xenophobic rhetoric that we, we get that people are, um, you know, out for themselves or the criminalisation of refugees, that, that lingo. 
people I met were incredibly welcoming with very little to give, you know, holding feasts from my son and my husband and I and um, sharing their stories very, very generously mm -hmm. in the hope that, you know, we could humanise. As, as you say, Jordan has a, a vast uh, refugee population. Mm. Many of them are from Syria. And while they have uh, found some sanctuary in the mm. host communities, uh, still many of them are living below the, the Jordanian national poverty line of yes. about $3 a day. I know that you reconnected with some of the people that you first met in, in 2016. Mm. How, how has their situation changed? What did they say to you? Yes, it was great to be able to reconnect with people to, in order to see where they were seven years on. Um, one family, um, Um and Abu Ib, um, Mohammed, they are in an urban setting, which is, of course, where the vast majority of refugees are in Jordan. And their situation is dire. Um, you know, they are, because not having the ability to work, having their, you know, children approaching the end of the school, their school, what, a couple of their daughters have been have been married um, and they, you know, they've been able to move from one apartment, but it's quite, still quite peripatetic and fragile. And so they're, you know, they really don't know necessarily where their meal is coming from. Because of course, even though the work of UNHCR is so vital and their partner organisations, they can't reach everybody. And, and things have changed since the pandemic, cost of living crisis and everything has become more yes. expensive. So, But also with Ukraine and, and even what's unfolding in, in Sudan, you know, the, the High Commissioner was saying that if the fighting doesn't stop, we could look at a displacement of 800,000 people in Sudan. So, of course, the World Food Programme, UNHCR, can't reach all of these people. So it just it reinforced to me the importance of the international community to maintain humanitarian aid for these neighbouring countries so that they can help give the refugees support and so they don't make perilous journeys. And Lebanon is also hosting uh, many Syrian refugees, mm. uh, over one and a half million. I know you've visited Lebanon yes. as well. And there was one case uh, that UNHCR has been following very closely uh, about a lady called Kadra who fled Homs in Syria. She's mm -hmm. 50 years old. She is a widow with five sons. Mm. She's struggling uh, to put food on the table and lives in constant fear of being evicted because she can't make the rent. Mm. But what was really striking about her story was that she made the very difficult decision to send her son Adnan to work he was three years old when they got to Lebanon and now he's 15 and he's never had an education hmm. so no, no prospects for him unless that changes. Is that the point at which hope diminishes when a child or an entire generation of refugee ch children can't access an education? I think education is an absolute lifeline no matter what country you grow up in or may have been displaced too, and that was something that really struck home to me in Bangladesh, in Lebanon, and um, in Jordan, both times I've been there. And particularly in Jordan this time, seeing children who were eight before and are now approaching the end of their education with no hope of having a tertiary education, but with so much to give. It doesn't behoove anyone, no matter how far away you are from the conflict, to, to know that there's an entire generation who are um, going to be dis disenfranchised and uneducated, particularly when they have so much, so much to give. And painful for me, I think, on a, on a personal level, knowing that my son, one of my sons who's just doing his A-levels, about to leave school, contemplating which university he might go to, and then meeting two boys, um, uh, Syrian uh, refugees in Jordan, who don't have that opportunity, whilst at the same time I'm here in England hearing this xenophobic rhetoric around the fact that boys like that, these innocent, vibrant, curious, humble boys that I met in, in Zartri, that they are somehow criminals or that they are a danger to society. I think there's, I saw nothing but opportunity. And I want to ask you as well, you mentioned it, uh, Cox's Bazaar Bangladesh. This is one million Rohingya refugees living mm. in the largest refugee camp in the world. The Rohingya, an ethnic minority who've been denied citizenship mm. in Myanmar, making them the world's largest uh, stateless population. And in 2017, there was persecution, human rights violations, so that yes. led to the, the fastest, largest influx of refugees into Bangladesh. And I remember when we were covering these stories, there were some really horrific accounts of torture, violence, gang rape. 
I'm just wondering if there's anyone that you spoke to, someone whose experience has really stuck in your mind. It was in, when in Bangladesh, in, in um, Cox's Bazaar, I met several people who had literally just arrived. Um, and there were two women in particular, one woman who had given birth um, and watched her house um, catch on fire um, and her husband had uh, fled and she didn't know where, where he was. She watched her grandmother be dismembered in front of her eyes and with a, a newborn baby had to move through the jungle and she was um, displaced internally for six months with a newborn baby and had just arrived to safety in, in Cox's Bazaar. When we say safety in Cox's mm -hmm. Bazaar, you know, just after I left, there were mudslides and then, of course, there were fires. The fragility and the temporality of their existence can't be stressed more highly. So the fact that she was considered, she was feeling safe was a relative concept to her. I mean, I can only imagine, I mean, giving birth is complex enough, but to do so um, as, a, as a single female, n having no food, no water, and no community, because your community has been decimated in front of your eyes, and then fleeing. Um, and of course, Bangladesh has been um, deeply welcoming to, um, by comparison to so many countries. But of course, as we know, the majority of refugees, 74% of them are, are, are housed and welcomed by um, countries who are the poorest countries in the world. So, you know, it, it's, it's frustrating and, and um, uh, to, to hear people talking about exclusionary um, policies, immigration policies, um, refugee policies, when in fact so much of the burden is being carried by those neighbouring countries. Speaking of that, you are the co-creator and executive producer of a, a very compelling, thought-provoking six-part drama on Netflix, Stateless. And there are these moments which really encapsulate the uh, political and the public aggression that you speak about towards refugees in host countries. And it's really captured in the language in parts. And there's one scene mm -hmm. in which your character, Pat, says, uh, and I will quote this to you, I know you love it here, as I do. If I let you in, everyone could be infected. I'm not going to let you destroy our way of life. It's our home, Sophie. You are not welcome here. Mm. How do you explain the failure of empathy for people who've been forced to leave their homes in such unimaginable circumstances? Yeah, so I mean, we set the series inside um, a cult of sorts, and it was a way of discussing offshore processing of asylum seekers and refugees, uh, but the, almost like a prequel. When it, when it moved um, from onshore to, to offshore. And I watched, um, you know, the welcoming, very, I mean, you know, brand Australia is sort of multiculturalism, that, you know, that sort of 90s term. And, um, and um, you know, we see ourselves as being very affable um, and welcoming as, as a culture. But I watched that calcification happen through continual xenophobic rhetoric, slogan, jingoistic slogans in, in the media um, repeatedly without people challenging them. And, and the discussion of the complexity of um, human migration and the displacement crisis being taken off the national agenda. And I think these are complex issues. And no one's denying that, you know, apart from the fact that, you know, there's a human crisis, it just gets politicised. But there are complex political problems when you're dealing with borders and populations and economic crises and pandemics. But we need to talk about them because it's only through... Um, but I suppose you know, people don't want to. They would rather sort of have them at a detention centre and a desolate bit of land and a place it, where you don't want to deal with it. It's interesting that people say people don't want to. I think that there's not the forums provided for it. And I think that that it's easier for, for our governments, if for people not to talk about it, for, not, for us not to talk about difficult things like the climate, you know, how do we tackle climate change as a, as a species? Because it's much easier, it doesn't seem to, it's not deemed to be election winning fodder. But people, by and large, individually, when you look at the homes of Ukraine, the outpouring of people in, in England who wanted to help people. I do think, by and large, people are generous. I think we are conditioned into not being through fear. And I think part of it is people say, what, what can you do as an individual to, to combat the human displacement crisis? I think part of it is challenging xenophobic 
rhetoric and looking to the facts and not the slogans because language is incredibly important and I think when we're fed that xenophobic language when we don't is connect it becoming to the individual now? I think it is and I think it is understandable with so many protracted crises going on and Syria is one you know that we w how much can we continue to give but the problem is unless we support the neighboring countries who are shouldering the majority of the burden then then the crisis doesn't go away it just mutates into something else and at the center of that are a generation are of people young making children the, do you reckon people are making the connection between uh, the migrants that are dying at sea, uh, people prepared to risk their lives and the wars and conflict and poverty and uh, climate-induced crisis mm. in their home countries. Is it that uh, the information isn't being disseminated? Is it that politicians are exploiting people's worst impulses? Or is it just that we, we need to be more curious and we're not doing a good enough job at holding our governments to account? I think it's all of the above. I think it's all of the above. I mean, I think everybody's having a, um, you know, we've all got problems of our own um, within our own families, our own communities. And, you know, I, I think when you when you see an, an enormous concentration of wealth and you feel that, that the governments aren't even serving their own population, then it's easier for them to demonise and otherise refugees who are displaced through absolutely no fault of their own. And that they're... But, for the great whatever god you believe in for the grace of you or god go i i mean that's what stateless is all about is that if, you know if 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 refugees can be treated that way then you yourself are only a hair's breadth away from being treated that way yourself i want to steal some more lines from stateless <laughs> feel free uh, because it actually kind of uh, conveys uh, sentiment and maybe the psychology behind some of these issues and political arguments mm. uh, better than any sort of government quote but there is this one bit where we hear from the character who's in charge of the detention center. And she does an expert job of making the government's argument. She says, Australia's detention regime is a reflection of our highly developed migration system, enabling us to determine both the identity of asylum seekers and the legitimacy of their claims for protection. And it allows us to do that in a way that protects our national security and order. Our standards are in keeping with the international guidelines. Uh, this is a first-class facility, she says, of mm. the detention centre, which is almost satirical when we see the sort of nightmarish scenes from what feels like mm. a, a prison. What did you want people to know about the conditions inside these facilities versus what the public are told, the government narrative? Well, at the time um, that we, we made the, the series, it was entirely off the national conversation. And we've seen, I mean, the High Commissioner for UNHCR was just in Australia recently, and there are positive developments with the change of government that, you know, say 19,000 people who are on temporary protection visas are now going to be resettled, that there is movement to finally address this shameful thing that was going... Um, um, offshore processing that was going on. I think it's the rhetoric. It's to look behind the rhetoric to the, the, the reality. Um, and, you know, there are many, many countries who have a, you know, um, a behaving in ways that are, that are less, far less than, than honourable. And which is really difficult for those countries who have been incredibly welcoming to refugees, like Germany, like the Scandinavian countries, like Jordan, where I was recently, like Bangladesh, like um, Lebanon. And it means it makes it more difficult for them because they have to shoulder an increased responsibility. It's a collective um, international concern. As the 1951 Refugee Convention points out, refugees are a collective responsibility and it seems to be something that we did understand in the wake of the Second World War and yet we, we are choosing to forget it or to allow ourselves to forget it. Well, of course, we're sitting here in London and um, taking inspiration from Australia. Uh, the UK mm. Uh, is now introducing some draconian policies which could leave tens of thousands of people, uh, including families with kids mm. and unaccompanied children, without access to the protection they're mm. entitled to under international law. The UNHCR has said that it's profoundly concerned. They say this legislation, if passed, would amount to an asylum ban extinguishing the right to seek refugee protection mm. for those who arrive here, no matter how compelling their claim may be. What would your message be to the UK Home Secretary if she was here right now? 
Well, that um, it's a basic fundamental human right that everyone have, has the right to seek safety and protection. And that I think any country that contravenes that basic human right does so at its own social and cultural detriment. You touched a couple of times on the, the way in which refugees are perceived and I mm -hmm. uh, want to ask you a little bit more about that uh, because you did mention this inspirational, galvanizing uh, approach uh, towards uh, the conflict in Ukraine. But what do you make of differing attitudes and perceptions depending on proximity or racial, cultural considerations? You know, sadly, the overwhelming support that we saw towards Ukrainian refugees isn't mm. something that we have seen expressed towards other people who are escaping conflict and poverty who often end up dying at sea. Mm. I think there's, a, there's a, a sense that people would make it perilous journey, um, either because they're foolhardy or because they have so much money that they could pay a, a, a people <laughs> smuggler. The people I have met have absolutely nothing and are prepared to do and um, to try and raise money in incredibly perilous, to, to their own detriment. I mean, you can imagine young women and girls the way they might be encouraged to, to earn the money to make that passage, but no one makes that passage unless no other option is available to them. I sat with a com an, in a community centre in Lebanon last time I was there. I sat and there were pharmacists, doctors, lawyers, um, a philosopher, a um, primary and secondary school teachers. These are educated people who are, who are not foolish. And one woman there, an architect with three daughters, was preparing to, um, to leave on a boat because she could not have her children out of education um, for any longer. They had been they were being denied an opportunity of a future and she saw that that was dwindling in front of her eyes. And so people don't, it's not because they are wealthy because they, um, or because they haven't got a brain in their heads, it's literally that the options are running out. So if you're going to talk about trying to protect people, you have to pave safe and humane pathways for them to seek asylum. It's like talking about um, climate change as, it, as it's going to be solved by one individual company, a country, it's a, it's a collective responsibility. And I think we ignore it at our own peril, not only um, moral peril, but economic peril, because of course it, it costs far more to exclude uh, a swathe of people than to include them. Or to acknowledge that they can be an asset to society as opposed to a burden. Well, so, quite. You know, changing I mean, the language around that. It is a weird thing I find um, with us as a species, is that we, we forget our recent history. We forget how positively our cultures have been built on, on the embrace and the welcoming of people post, post the Second World War. We see that as a, a moment of great honour for, for this country in, in, in particular. Um, and if we went back in time and were, were talking in the same way that we're speaking now, I think we would be quite shocked. There's a great deal of focus on the physical harm and exploitation of refugees. How can we convey the, the, the mental suffering uh, that can come from that, even if you are resettled. You know, these are issues that will probably affect people for the rest of their lives, given what they've been through. Is there enough of an understanding of that? I, I, I think that there's untold trauma, um, you know, for people who have lived um, in conflict. And, of course, a lot of people fleeing Syria have been internally displaced before they were forced to cross a border. I've met families that, you know, one child was... Um, one of their children was... Um, had... Um, uh, cerebral palsy and they had to literally abandon their bags and carrying her carry her across the berm into into Jordan so they literally come with nothing and you don't lose those scars but what has been remarkable to me is the generosity and the resilience and the you know there's such a hunger to give back to their host communities you know, people I met last time in Jordan one woman was pregnant and now she's um, put herself through tertiary education she was a lucky few who got a Daffy scholarship and now she's teaching in the camp as a primary school teacher. So there's, they have so much to offer. I mean, the, the way that they have overcome their immediate trauma is profoundly inspirational to me. You said you've been a UNHCR ambassador for seven years now. Mm -hmm. How has it changed you and your work as an actor? I know it's infused your creative work, but uh, what might come next for you? Would you ever take it to the political arena? Oh, I mean, I think everything's politicised. Um, no, I see... I, see um, I don't see my work as being political. 
Um, but I, I, I do see it as a great privilege to in some way find uh, a non-instructional but empathetic way to communicate these stories. And you speak about stateless. I'm also very um, drawn to, as a lot of people are, to Baruz Bachani's um, story, in which he wrote on a mobile phone, No Friend But The Mountains. You know, there are so many extraordinary... Yusuf Masani's story, you know, um, The Swimmers, it's... it's You know, there's so many incredible stories of, of resilience and hope and inventiveness that, um, you know, I'd be thrilled to sort of bring to the screen. I see that's my, that's my role. Well, thank you very much for speaking to us. Kate thank Manchin. you. Thank you.